I'm back. So we'll take questions specific to this particular talk. Any other questions related to concepts or lab, wait till after the tea break. So we'll spend the next half an hour taking questions specific to this flipped classroom talk. Yeah, please speak. Uh, Ma'am, my first question is, uh, suppose in one hour lecture, how much portion we have to allocate for multimedia and traditional content and second one is what is the frequency of switching between that we have al uh, always uh, confused about that that how can we uh, switch between those contents in a one hour lecture okay i mean um, i thought the talk covered some of this but uh, maybe not in too much detail so the way I had uh, conducted the course is the multimedia content is totally not during class hours. They are supposed to watch it during whenever they are free. So typically at IIT Bombay, we have what uh, in a traditional setting, three hours of contact time and they are supposed to work three hours outside class hours. So overall six hours per subject is the rough uh, figure. So out of the three hours of contact time, what I typically do is I ask them to watch roughly the equivalent of two hours of video content. Um, so I will put maybe four or five videos for them to watch. So this thing they are supposed to do whenever they want. And then what we do is we meet face to face for one hour in a week. And what we do during the face to face, there is no media, no multimedia content there. It's just face to face. And what I do, this is the tutorial session I was talking about. So during this time, you can use it to do multiple things. Like you could uh, do some practice problems. Uh, that's kind of uh, not uh, that interesting. Uh, but you could also do this thing pair share. The talk is going to happen uh, tomorrow. So if you uh, go through it, you will understand what I'm talking about. Basically, what you do is uh, you have covered some concept. Now you're going to try to apply that concept in some other setting. So you post that problem and ask the students to work in groups to come up with solutions. So there's a lot of discussion that happens. Um, and again, depends on you could also demonstrate some interesting lab concept as part of the tutorial. So tutorial uh, design is again a big task. Uh, that is something you have to pay a lot of attention to. So they learn something uh, offline without the face to face and when they come face to face you need to design the curriculum during the face to face such that they are uh, motivated and uh, want to do interesting things. So it should be something that makes them think or something that makes them solve some problem or something that uh, shows them a demo of something. So that should be what the face to face tutorial session should be. Uh, Ma'am there is one more question. Uh, as you were talking in your talk that uh, the teachers from the remote areas of the country, uh, from the engineering colleges of the remote areas of the country can collaborate with uh, IIT B or IIT other, other IITs. So is there any platform available where uh, teachers from uh, engineering colleges like us can actually collaborate to develop such type of videos and uh, you know, study material and something like that? So that we can also implement that flipped classroom structure very effectively in our institute also. Yeah, so there isn't any, so there is effort towards creating such, uh, uh, I wouldn't say, see Bodhi Free is a platform that is used for uh, running the courses in a flipped classroom setting. Um, and there is an effort by, I think Professor Patak was also mentioning, Indian government is also very much interested in developing an India specific MOOCs platform, which is like Boditree or edX or Coursera or whatever it is. So we want it India specific and there will be a lot of ecosystem around it. Like once you have such a platform, you want to use that platform to populate it with content, populate it with questions, populate with labs. 
So there's a lot of stuff you have to add on to this particular platform. So there is definitely, what is it called, uh, uh, push towards creating an India-specific MOOCs platform. Will maybe in another year from now, maybe things will uh, be more, um, such a platform will come into being and uh, things will become more clear. Now regarding the course content as well as quizzes and other things, so people, teachers like you and me across India can potentially contribute uh, within that. Uh, so for that also, um, once the platform is there to host, uh, one has to work out what is the method to, so we could conduct again some training workshops uh, that uh, tell how to, so, so in order to create these kind of videos, we use certain tools. Like uh, I was using a tool called Camtasia. Uh, it's a paid proprietary thing, but uh, we use it. And uh, so how to create that kind of content? So some kind of workshops for it. And again, as I said, quality also is quite important. We don't want, there will be a lot of content developers. So one has to pay attention to, um, so maybe some peer review kind of a system should also be in place that tells, okay, this content uh, is pretty good, whereas this content could use refinement. Um, so that kind of ecosystem currently is not there, but we are trying, we are interested in it and we are going to work towards it. So MOOCs, as I said, is a very recent phenomena, especially in the Indian context. Um, there are many players, many universities, IITs, as well as others who are interested in this space. Uh, right now, each one is working a bit independently of each other, so hopefully uh, they will all converge some point and uh, take it forward. So that the clarity will only emerge after a few years. It's too early to kind of uh, uh, have clarity at this stage. Hello, good morning, ma'am. Good morning. This is Sri Priya from uh, Chennai. Huh? We were hearing to your uh, flipped classroom discussion. Uh, we do agree uh, with all, all the things we, you discussed, but I am actually a person from EC background. Uh, how to uh, use all these facilities uh, or how to use all these uh, things effectively for a derivative paper? Could you please give some suggestions? What do you mean by derivative paper? You are saying theoretical. Like, yeah, no, more, more of equation oriented papers. You are talking about running a course that has lot of equations in it, is that what you are asking? Yes ma'am. Huh. So that would mean someone has to create content based on, so uh, I understand that uh, whatever this course content material that is there um, has been designed for computer science students because we come from a systems perspective. But the same course, if it were taught in the electrical department or electronics and communication, there is a theory factor. So they spend a lot of time uh, and evaluating, for example, the MAC protocols through some probability analysis or Markov chain kind of analysis. Uh, so the question is, if you want to use this platform for that kind of flip classroom thing, someone has to create a content specific to the electrical, electronics. So that is what I was mentioning is, uh, it can be computer networks course. Right now, there are, let's say, 60 concepts. You could add on another 20 concepts that are theoretical um, in nature. And uh, if you are running it, you just can pull uh, whatever concept you want, create the syllabus, and use it. But the content has to be created. And that content is best created by someone who is more comfortable with that kind of uh, uh, thing. So going forward, yeah, someone will create. Um, again, uh, I had, uh, I think I didn't explicitly mention it, but if uh, I will put up a Google uh, uh, sheet, anyone who is interested in um, adding more content to this computer networks multimedia textbook, like saying, I want this concept to be covered as part of the textbook, I will go through it. Uh, if I find it uh, something that I can do, I will add that particular concept also. That way, we'll create a superset. Thank you, ma'am. Huh. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Good morning. Present huh. here, uh, run classroom, this fifth classroom. Uh, I am asking you regarding this auto graders. In the lab session, you are uh, talking about the auto graders. Yes. Supposing a question is given to the students, 
they answer it and uh, we need to grade it the grade the answer as per this yes. you are talking about auto grader madam so let me tell a little bit more about auto grader then maybe it will be some clarity so currently the platform has some questions already asked these are in the form of multiple choice or fill in the blank where if it were a fill in the blank i specify in what format you had to fill in the blank so these are concept based questions so that the platform already handles uh, the platform naturally in fact if, uh, not just this platform any platform will find it very difficult to handle descriptive type of questions like if you give a design problem and ask them to design some protocol Uh, i have to grade it manually because uh, there is no tool that will automatically do it but when i say auto grader in that context uh, that is more specific to the lab component so for example if it's a data structures lab there is lot of coding that you do that is coding of uh, uh, lab exercises uh, like programs it need not be c it could be python it could be java it could be any programming language so that has also been finished completion so we have in fact integrated it as part of bodhi tree and it will undergo trial runs in the next semester here at iitb across two courses uh, one is a, a post graduate level software uh, systems lab and another is a computer architecture lab so we will see how it goes and then we will open it up for others so it's basically going to grade programming type of uh, assignments so yeah that's auto grader thank you ma'am one more question with regard to the lecture time he said video uh, lecturing time he said 9 minutes uh, is quite ideal he yeah. said 20 minutes you can go sometimes we listen to the lectures hours together sure sure so i request you to give uh, the most ideal time as per your research so this in fact for has videos. been studied extensively i think in many of these uh, uh, edx course coursera platforms where they kind of capture the students uh, how much do they watch when do they stop the video and uh, go away and what they have found ideally is the lecture the video has time has to be under 10 minutes anything above 10 minutes i think uh, results in a very steep fall in the students watching the video but there is a uh, what is it called uh, a clause there in that those students see here at iit bombay if i am putting up a video and i am saying you watch the video i'm and i'm going to give a quiz based on it that will count towards your grade then they have a lot more incentive to watch the video because if they didn't don't watch it they will do badly and thereby get a bad grade as part of the uh, degree uh, whereas in these platforms like uh, coursera or edx i mean you enroll but it's not that Uh, your life is dependent on the grade that you are going to get there so you can tend tend to take it easy uh, that clause is there but still from whatever feedback i have gotten from my own students beyond 20 minutes they say their interest levels their focus goes away uh, ideally i would say video should be about 10 minutes at most but as an instructor i find it difficult because you just get started you tell something and then Uh, if you have to stop at 10 minutes it's an abrupt break it's not a clean break but to the extent i mean i didn't pay much attention to it during the multimedia uh, content that i have created but i will try to break them up into smaller uh, portions going forward thank you thank you ma'am yeah. good morning ma'am ha huh, good morning ma'am uh, regarding a uh, scoreboard ma'am i have a uh, some uh, clarification Uh, which student will answer suppose uh, any one student attend the question and uh, get the answer correct answer mm. he can pass to the next student and the next student also score good marks yes likewise uh, how we can evaluate the student performance okay so in my course when i had run this scoreboard marks had no contribution towards their grade zero contribution so i have not used i know the students will copy uh, if it is very important to them otherwise if it is just even there there may be copy cases so it's not that uh, they may not copy there but the incentive for it is less because it's not going to count towards their grade the the but scoreboard really worked in the sense that it generated a healthy competition among the students 
there were always a bunch of students who wanted to see themselves at the top of the scoreboard because I also used to encourage them and what I used to do is almost every two weeks whoever is in the top I used to uh, give them a treat like uh, announce their names give some gift kind of a, some chocolate or whatever it is uh, so they used to feel a little bit motivated and uh, generally seeing their names in the top it kind of uh, uh, motivates them but more than that also I think lot of them so when I normally put up assignments earlier also in a traditional classroom setting I used to put up assignments but very few people used to solve the assignments they will come directly for the midsem or final with uh, minimum practice but with this Bodhi tree platform something that I have seen is majority of the students had actually solved the problem so because of the fact that it is all in one place and they get immediate feedback as soon as they solve a problem they get to know whether their answer is correct or wrong so before again in traditional setting you pose the questions after one week you pose the solutions so that in lack of immediate feedback they forget what they have done they have to refresh again so it does not really uh, help them that much so the fact that you are getting immediate feedback that tells you whether you are right or wrong that is also something that they have uh, uh, appreciated so again before the exams they revisit all these problems go through them quickly so it kind of helped them in that context as well so the role of scoreboard is not I am not going to use it for grading uh, it is just to encourage them uh, to work such that it's, it enables a healthy competition among the students I was noting down uh, some of the, uh, my earlier, uh, earlier uh, speakers uh, views on teaching and learning software so I noted down certain things uh, uh, now in our remote center uh, which is basically a degree engineering college offering BTEC and MTech courses in different disciplines we practice several things like uh, this semester itself I am going to introduce uh, Vashek and NS2 on cloud because you know as people face lots of difficulties in installation of uh, these softwares especially NS2 so I am going to uh, make them available on the cloud via rich internet application first and second thing uh, uh, this uh, for basic network concept uh, we need to ha use some certain comments which we either go for windows uh, command prompt or Linux uh, terminals so for for example if students does uh, a student doesn't have a computer ready in front of him or her he or she can use uh, his or her smartphone to access the terminal via terminal via a cloud which provides the service of these uh, terminals and uh, third is uh, coming to Camtasia studio I once used the software for making some of my slides which are hosted on YouTube channels so now I didn't find it quite handy because it takes too much of the memory so uh, the computer on which I'm working it makes uh, it is made so sluggish that sometimes I cannot proceed with uh, recording as well as working uh, with the uh, uh, so software like Android SDK so it becomes very difficult so for uh, these things we are going to introduce a cloud recording system which will uh, you know uh, uh, compress uh, the multimedia information in, 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 in a preparatory format and later on convert it to the uh, format desired uh, on, a, uh, on a later time and fourth regarding the attendance system of students in classroom which allows us one hour of class uh, it takes a lot a longer time to take the attendance uh, so it at least takes 10, 10 minutes to roll call of a student uh, comprising of 100 students so we uh, practice a thing where each of the students are asked to uh, wear a certain you know uh, an ID card which will comprise of a QR code and uh, and the uh, and, and lab or the classroom is uh, continuously under video surveillance and uh, the, the video frames extracted to for decode codes and mark the student present so what do you think uh, where are we going in the correct direction okay I mean the definitely whatever you have mentioned the first three points about the providing an environment for people to log in uh, using their smartphones and so on I mean that's something there is definitely a need for it uh, we are also kind of uh, working towards that direction so I definitely feel uh, it's good 
regarding your uh, final point about uh, attendance i mean something that we do here at uh, iit bombay i mean it's not it's something that the administration does is uh, most of the classrooms are fitted with a biometric uh, attendance thing so before the student enters he has to take his uh, fingerprint before he comes in so that turns out to be a, i think probably an easier solution than uh, video surveillance with um, what is it called expecting them to wear something um, but again with the use of smartphones something that uh, you could potentially do if we are talking about a smart classroom which has wi-fi and uh, everyone has a smartphone you can definitely do some um, authentication uh, again within limits because the people could pass on their uh, smartphone to someone else and do something but yeah some attendance system there could also be worked out yeah, uh, we once had a plan to introduce biometrics, but you know, uh, in uh, self-financed colleges, it's very difficult to get biometric devices always ready. And uh, and places where power cut is often a, uh, a bigger problem, uh, these biometric devices might not run properly. And ment and so is the maintenance. So in remote uh, remote places uh, from the metros, it's very difficult to get these uh, devices always up. So, keeping that in mind, we introduced this QR code system. But the video and surveillance uh, also to... will cause power, I mean, if there is a power cut, how will your video surveillance work? It's done by on, only a laptop, the teacher's laptop which runs on the battery, uh, by oh. the webcam. So, oh. it, it is very much accurate and it has been proven to give you 100% accuracy, okay. not less. Okay. And uh, last of all, I had a question. So one of my former speaker, he was uh, about uh, the data structures and how students' motivation can be, uh, you know, uh, induced for the subject. Uh, so rightly you said that uh, for the first 10 minutes, students uh, motivate themselves to the learning and uh, their focus try to recede as, so, as the time passes. So uh, here I, ha I have uh, one uh, strategy to get them induced by introducing real life problems which uh, directly uh, interfere with data structure. For example, as we talk about Android, we have must have heard of the swipe keyboard of Android, where we scribble a thing, uh, editing of a document or to, to type a text message or whatever. So uh, it's basically a replication of data structure. So uh, what I have asked my students in PG level as well as in BTEC level, obviously in form of a project as of now, uh, to make an application on on Windows itself, not for the smartphone as of now, to make a software where there will be several, uh, you know, virtual keyboard where dragging the pointer device, it may be mouse for touch screen devices, it can be simply a finger touch, uh, to stable to different letters and it will, the form of the curve, and it will, you know, uh, not only make a uh, you know, permutation of the words that we have in the dictionary but also it will have provision to add some uh, learning feature to the software because once I uh, make some new word which the dictionary doesn't uh, really recognize it can be added to the dictionary and again coming to the learning uh, we can prioritize which of the words are relevant to the current document and that becomes artificial intelligence so clubbing things together I think uh, this uh, way we can induce students to get more and more motivated to topics like data structure where we where we lock students, uh, you know, interest. What do you think, madam? Yeah, sure. I mean, definitely interspersing activities with videos is a good way forward. Yeah. Uh, my question is that uh, actually we are on a track of OBE guidelines, outcome-based education. So that is based on, I think, Bloom's taxonomy, right? So can you give uh, some techniques or can you discuss some methods which can be applied to average or poor students? Yeah, I mean, uh, so a lot of this flipped classroom uh, is also uh, working towards improving the learning of the students. Um, and uh, Sridhar, who is going to give a talk uh, the next two days, he is going to share with you some of these active learning concepts that also are supposed to work towards uh, students, improving students' understanding of the particular concepts. So, I mean, I would say just wait till both of his talks 
um, you will get to know some of the techniques that can be employed in a classroom setting to improve the learning of students. Often we ask subjective questions in exam and do the subjective assessment, how it can be incorporated in flipped based classroom. Yeah. So one thing I want to make clear is flip place classroom is more for what is it called instead of you going to a classroom and teaching something there is it's more from the learning perspective it's not quite from the evaluation perspective evaluation of a student be it so typically if you want to test whether the student has learned something you do need to ask this kind of subjective descriptive type of questions you cannot go with multiple choice or fill in the blanks so that for that you do have to set up your own exams and grade them in a, a typical uh, classroom setting where the students come sit in rows separated by one seat uh, you pass the question paper and they answer it you collect it and you grade it so all that uh, is kind of orthogonal to the flipped classroom thing that said the flipped classroom can help to the extent possible in practice problems like the kind of practice problems you have already seen on Bodhi tree which are multiple choice uh, or uh, in fact I also provided descriptive questions except that they are not graded uh, you are given the descriptive question it is on if you really want to learn the subject you should practice yourself and then once you are sure that this is my solution then click on the solution to compare your solution with the uh, solution. So flip classroom does facilitate uh, practice problems whatever you want the subjective, uh, descriptive, multiple choice, fill in the blanks everything but when it comes to evaluation it is orthogonal you have to do your own evaluation typically in this particular setup. Thank you ma'am. Ma'am, Philip, uh, classroom is innovative idea. It's really helpful for urban area students. But uh, what about the rural area students who have slow internet connections? So we are again working towards uh, um, an offline mode of uh, flip classroom. So this Bodhi Tree platform itself, uh, you could potentially, if you install something on your uh, machine, um, you could uh, do most of the stuff remotely. But whenever you have internet access or even if it were a low internet access, it will sync between your thing with the server and kind of uh, get your score or other aspects. Um, so there is an offline version of it which we are currently, I mean it's, uh, we, ha we have just now started work, it will take some time. One more question. Uh, we have many tools for. Uh, creating online uh, video lectures or online uh, lectures but uh, most of the time uh, computer science people so computer science faculties are aware about the, all the tools but what about the like other uh, departments they are not aware about these tools and they are not comfortable about these tools so uh, I think uh, there should be a workshop on Camtasia or like e-learning tools or like iSpring these tools are available for the video lectures see the tool I mean I have used Camtasia it's uh, I won't think that you need to have a computer science background to be able to uh, use this tool uh, it does involve some learning if you're totally technology averse then naturally it will not work but then you may not even consider flip classroom in that context but with some basic training it's not a very difficult tool to use you don't really need to be a computer science uh, background to be able to use the tool thank you thank you very much in, in class, uh, theoretic, if you relate the theoretical concept with day-to-day -day practical examples, can it provide an effective teaching? Precisely. I mean, any teaching, I think, especially of subjects that are technology-oriented, like computer networks or databases or whatever it is where there is a lot of technology related to it, you should have a hands-on component. So mostly these go hand-in-hand -hand with a laboratory session where whatever concept you learn you actually uh, use it for uh, uh, learning through hands-on some implementation the concept that you have learned in theory so anything that has a technology component to be of it should be designed such that uh, for best, best learning it should go hand in hand
Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Technology you are talking about is much better, good motivation and encouragement, but I have tried this practically uh, with a small email test. The students, uh, as the analysis shown by you about IIT is you know, only 9%, 12%, 42% of masses engineering students of a lot of uh, university, uh, many engineering colleges. And personally, I have tried, it, uh, tried a small email test, but I didn't get much response from students. So what I think is there's no environment around us uh, it might be very well when you're talking about IIT's environment, but what about the masses engineering colleges? See, I mean, they, I, I totally understand as well as agree with you that uh, the kind of environment in many of the engineering colleges uh, is not very conducive to uh, learning. In other words, the way they are tested, the question papers themselves, if it's a rote kind of a thing where you just say what, uh, describe the seven layers of the OSI protocol stack, I mean you're not learning anything, it's just you memorize it and you reproduce it into the paper. So there are many things that have to change in order to cultivate an environment of learning in the engineering colleges, starting from changing the way the questions are asked, the syllabus itself probably needs revision, adoption of some of these things. And finally, from a student's perspective, it all boils down to a job. So they want to do the bare minimum possible to get good grades or whatever it is, such that they can land a job. So I mean, and it's not something you should say you should do for learning's sake. I mean, their priorities are different, and I think you should respect that as well. So given that, I think what we need is a shift, a big shift in training students for the kind of job oriented skill set where they learn concepts with a hands on component. So that also motivates no matter how disinterested a student is, you throw him a challenge in the form of okay, you know, this is this and if you try it out hands on, they do get motivated. We do see that even at IIT, there are many students who are not that motivated. But in the labs, they like it because they are actually getting to see. So for example, you use email. If you show them a demo of what's happening behind email, most people do get excited about it. So you just need to build that environment. Uh, I mean, it is not easy. It will take a lot of effort in multiple dimensions. Um, people are working towards it. The hope is that in a few years from now, hopefully things will change. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ma'am. I'm yeah. Mitika Sharma. I would like to ask a question. Many times I come across students who are forced to do engineering rather than by their own choice. So how should we motivate and encourage them to study? Well, I think we face it a lot. I mean, we majority of the students at IITB, I feel, uh, also fall um, uh, into that category. It's, it is tough, as I said, uh, as a teacher, for someone who is not at all interested in technology or engineering and he wants to do some other uh, area or he, when they come in itself, they want to do an MBA, there isn't really much, how much ever you bend backwards to motivate. Uh, so definitely throwing a challenge at them keeps them interesting, but they may be interested, they may learn something. But their final goal, let's say, is to do an MBA or to do something else. There is only little that you could do. Uh, so I kind of just focus on, fine, if they're not interested, there's not much I can do. But at least let me focus my energy and efforts on those that are interested. And at the same time, keep the content exciting and challenging with the hope that those that are not interested will also pay some attention and pick something in the process. But from the point that you have said, it needs a, a, what is it called, societal change to bring about it. The parents, everyone have to nurture the child such that he can, he or she can pursue what is it that they are interested in rather than this herd mentality of go for medicine or engineering. So unless that changes, uh, there isn't that much we can do as instructors other than uh, keep the material exciting. Yeah, so I think with this uh, we will stop this uh, uh, session, we will break for tea and once we come back I will give you an overview of the upcoming lab 
as well as we'll take some more concept based uh, question and answers thank you Thank you.